Have you ever wanted to know just how extreme life can get in terms of the environments that it lives in? Well, in this video, I'm going to be talking about extremophiles and the extremely cold, salty, acidic, and hot environments that they live in, including a couple other types of extremophiles that I'll also go over that I don't even have listed here. First, we'll start with those organisms that have very specific temperature requirements. Psychrophiles are extremophiles that like really cold conditions from less than zero to around 20 degrees Celsius, and that equates to below freezing or 32 degrees Fahrenheit to around 68 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll talk in a second about just how much below zero biological activity is possible. The next category is psychotolerant organisms. These organisms like to live around 20 to 40 degrees Celsius, very similar to mesophiles, which are like temperate, medium temperature liking organisms but the psychrotolerant organisms can live or grow at temperatures below 20, even around zero degrees Celsius. Moving to the other end of the spectrum though, with thermophiles, these guys like it pretty hot, anywhere from around 45 to 80 degrees Celsius, which equates to around 110 degrees Fahrenheit to around 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Guys, that's pretty hot. I would not want to live in an environment that was 180 degrees Fahrenheit can already barely handle the 110 degrees Fahrenheit that we get in the summer down here. But that's nothing if we compare it to the hyperthermophiles. Hyperthermophiles are just exactly like thermophiles. They also like heat, but they go to another level. They like temperatures from around 60 to 115 degrees Celsius. That equates to around 140 degrees Fahrenheit to around 240 degrees Fahrenheit. And there are some that live at hydrothermal vents that can get up to like 400 degrees Celsius. And so obviously much hotter, but these types of organisms typically live on the periphery of such environments where the hot water that is like 400 degrees Celsius is mixing with the cooler water of the ocean as it comes out of the vents. And then it is some temperature in the middle. That's where the hyperthermophiles and thermophiles like to live. And so it's not fully that hot as the vent fluid, but it's like a mixture of the cool and hot fluid. So it's still pretty hot. But to get into the details of these organisms, let's start with psychrophiles or the cold loving organisms. Psychrophiles like environments where it's constantly cold. They could be killed by warming. So living in temperate environments where it warms during certain seasons is not possible for many psychrophiles. The environments where they can live include open ocean water, where it remains around three degrees Celsius on average under sea ice, in permafrost, and in snow fields. Snow fields can sometimes have a red, green, orange, brown, or purple tint due to the coloration of the algae living within them. Active cells, meaning actively reproducing and growing cells, have been reported at temperatures as low as negative 15 degrees Celsius. That's around 5 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees below freezing. But in some cases, water can remain unfrozen at these temperatures depending on the pressure or salinity, allowing cells in such water pockets in these environments to continue to live and grow. At below around 20 degrees Celsius, however, cells may stop growing and actually go into a dormant state for millions of years until conditions become more favorable in which they can start growing again after millions of years, which is pretty crazy. Some organisms go to even greater lengths to find livable habitats. For example, endoliths live inside rocks. They can penetrate into and live in rocks to benefit from that microclimate or microenvironment. Psychrotolerant organisms, however, live in slightly different environments than psychrophiles. Many times they overlap, but psychrotolerant organisms can tolerate temperate environments because they can tolerate seasonal warming and cooling. So these organisms live in environments like soils, water in temperate climates, even food that we eat like meat, milk, and other dairy products, cider, vegetables, and fruits. And although growth slows at low temperatures, like temperatures of refrigeration and freezing, it doesn't necessarily stop or kill the organisms. Even though psychotolerant organisms don't grow best at 4 degrees Celsius, the temperature of refrigeration, they will still grow. It's just a bit slower. And even if we try and freeze our foods, it doesn't 
necessarily kill the organisms. Again, like I mentioned earlier, they can go into a dormant state and then revive themselves after they become warm enough again to live. So what are the adaptations that allow such organisms like psychrophiles to be able to live in such extreme conditions? One adaptation that psychrophiles have is that they contain more alpha helices than beta sheets in their enzyme structure. What does this mean? Well, enzymes and proteins, they are made of amino acid chains, and that's their primary structure. Then those amino acid chains are twisted and folded up into secondary structures, like the twisted structure of alpha helices and the folded structure or pleated structure of beta sheets. Both of these structures are common in enzymes, and then the tertiary and quaternary structures are just more folding of those secondary helices and sheets. But these secondary structures, although they're a mixture of both helices and sheets can have more of one than the other. And when you have more alpha helices than beta sheets, the enzyme has more flexibility. Psychrophiles also have more polar and less hydrophobic amino acids and less weak bonds in the protein structure. All of these adaptations listed so far are to increase the enzyme or protein's flexibility. However, they also have an adaptation to increase the fluidity of their membrane. So remember that enzymes and proteins are things within the cell that are carrying out functions and the membrane of the cell is like the border the wall and within the membrane there are fatty acids and these fatty acids can either be unsaturated or saturated unsaturated fatty acids contain a double bond or polyunsaturated fatty acids contain multiple double bonds and less hydrogen atoms. Double bonds often cause the fatty acids to kink and all of this kinking increases the fluidity of the membrane at such low temperatures where it would tend to become more rigid. Moving on now from psychrophiles to the other end of the spectrum with thermophiles. Thermophiles live in environments like soil surfaces under full sunlight that during the day can get up to around 50 degrees Celsius, compost piles and silage that can get up to 70 degrees Celsius, and of course volcanic environments where volcanism provides heat to environments like hot springs and hydrothermal vents. These of course can get up to temperatures much higher in the case of black smoke or hydrothermal vents up to around 400 degrees Celsius. Unlike in cold, the growth at high temperatures for these thermophiles and hyperthermophiles is rapid, and these organisms are typically prokaryotic like bacteria and archaea because these can grow at much higher temperatures than eukaryotes. Additionally, hypothermophiles are typically archaea because archaea can grow at even higher temperatures than bacteria. Bacteria are known to grow up to but not more than 95 degrees Celsius, and archaea can be hyperthermophiles up to 115 and even greater uh, degrees Celsius. Additionally, non-phototrophic organisms are typically these thermophiles and hyperthermophiles because they grow at higher temperatures than phototrophic organisms. In other words, these hyperthermophiles Hypophilic archaea are typically chemotrophic. So what adaptations allow thermophile and hyperthermophiles to live at such extremely hot environments? Well, specific amino acid substitutions allow enzymes to fold in a way more heat stable, and more ionic bonds in the proteins also allow it to resist unfolding or denaturing at such high temperatures. Hypothermophilic archaea also have membranes that are monolayers rather than the typical phospholipid bilayer membrane of bacteria and eukaryotes. These monolayer membranes help the archaea to prevent their membrane from melting at such high temperatures. Moving on now from temperature to pH. Many organisms like to live at neutral pHs, and these are called neutrophiles, living most optimally at pH values of around 6 to 8. But there's also many fungi and prokaryotes that like to live at more acidic environments, anywhere from pH 1 to 6, and these are called acidophiles. But there's also alkaliphiles that are typically prokaryotic that like to live at alkaline or basic pHs of around 7 to 11. Acidophiles are often not just acid tolerant, but actually require acidity for the stability of their membranes. The environments that these acidophiles like to live in include acid mine drainage, or AMD, and acidic thermal soils, while alkaliphiles typically live in soda lakes or alkaline lakes or high carbonate soils. As you can probably imagine, since many alkaline lakes are also incredibly salty, many alkaliphiles are also 
halophilic, or they also love salt, which we'll talk more about halophiles in a second. But first, I need to make the distinction between extracellular and intracellular pH limits. Acidophiles and alkali files can tolerate and even sometimes require low and high pHs in their external environment. All organisms must remain relatively near neutral in their pH in their you know, internal cytoplasm environment in order for essential molecules like DNA to remain viable. Estimated internal pH limits for any biology on Earth are around 4.6 to 9.5. Those are basically the limits at both the low end of the pH spectrum and the high end of the pH spectrum that we've observed life be able to tolerate in terms of their internal pH without dying. But based on our knowledge of chemistry in terms of the essential molecules within cells, we know that it can't be much lower or higher than that, and those are probably pretty close to, if not the limits, for intracellular pH. Now moving on to halophiles. Halophiles are those organisms that love salt. Now just to give a reference, seawater is around 3% sodium chloride or salt, and non-halophiles like it at or less than around this value. Halotolerant organisms, however, are optimal around this value, but can tolerate higher percentages of salt or salinity, and mild halophiles like it around 1 to 6 percent salt, and halophiles themselves like it anywhere from 7 to 15 percent salt. That's getting pretty salty, but extreme halophiles take it to an even more extreme level in which they like it at 15 to 30 percent salt. I mean, they like it so extreme that their little line here goes off the chart. I mean, it's literally off the chart. <laughs> so the environments that halophiles enjoy are similar to those that we talked about for alkali files. They like soda lakes, like the alkali files, as well as brines and brine-like environments like marine salterns, which are man-made systems where seawater is sequentially pumped through a succession of shallow ponds, leading to increasingly concentrated brines and eventually evaporate precipitation. Some halophiles live in foods as well and survive in the foods even when salts and sugars are used as preservatives. Those that like environments with high sugar content are osmophiles, and those that like really dry environments, may dry by dissolved solutes like salt, are called xerophiles. And the last type of extremophiles I'll talk about today include aerobes and anaerobes. This type of extremophile has to do with oxygen content, and this is the type that I find most exciting because my research has to do with anaerobes. So the categories of aerobes include aerobes, which we are. We are aerobic respiring organisms. We respire oxygen and we like oxygen concentrations of our current atmosphere, that is around 21% oxygen, and microaerophiles are those organisms that like it below the atmospheric oxygen concentration, so below 21%, and they like these microaerobic environments typically because they contain an oxygen-sensitive enzyme or more than one oxygen-sensitive enzymes. The last type of aerobes are facultative aerobes that can grow in either oxic or anoxic without oxygen oxygen environments. How do they do that if they're aerobes and they aerobically respire oxygen? Well, facultative anaerobes can aerobically respire oxygen when the environment is oxic, but they typically have an alternative way of metabolizing when the conditions are anoxic, just in case they get themselves into a situation where they don't have oxygen around. They can survive in both. Pretty freaking cool. But there's also other organisms that can survive in non-oxygenated environments, and these are anaerobes. In fact, many anaerobes anaerobes can't even survive when oxygen is around. They not only do not use oxygen for their metabolism, but they also can't tolerate it, and those are called obligate anaerobes. They like 0% oxygen, and they do not want even 1% there, and sometimes they can tolerate a little, but they're harmed, their growth is slowed, and eventually they might die because of it. These include many prokaryotes, some fungi, and some protozoa. But there's also aerotolerant anaerobes that can tolerate oxygen but they don't use it, they still use anaerobic metabolisms. 
And environments that anaerobic organisms live in include stratified lakes and seas, such as those that are restricted and the mixing is restricted within them. So their water column becomes stratified where the bottom part is oxygen free. And they can also live in the deep anoxic zone of soils and sediment. I talk about how sediments and soils can have different metabolic zones in my oxic, suboxic, and anoxic zones video. And I'll link it up here to the right if you want to check it out. And and they can also even live in our own guts and other animals' guts. And these gut microbes help make up our microbiome. And here's a fun fact for you guys. Sulfate-reducing bacteria produce hydrogen sulfide gas, which eventually leads to the sulfitic smell of our farts. And I work with these bacteria in the lab, so my lab constantly smells like farts. On that note, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope you guys will come check out the upcoming video about when life first moved to land and then I'll also talk in upcoming geobiology videos about eukaryotic evolution and anaerobic to aerobic organism evolution when the oxidation of earth happened and all of that and all of that will be in my geobiology playlist which will pop up down here at some point for you to click if you want to check out any other geobio videos on my channel and then I am using references introduction to geomicrobiology by Kurt Kahnhauser as well as the Brock Biology of Microorganisms books for my major references for this and other videos in this playlist. And they'll be linked down below if you want to check them out. And with that, guys, I will let you go. I will show you uh, my cat here because she's adorable and she just sleeps throughout my videos because again, guys, apparently they're just very boring. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for watching, guys, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.